Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. We're seeing some chatter in the chat. My name is Nicole. I'll be helping MC us through the afternoon here. We're just going to wait a few minutes and get started very shortly with Rachel Potvin. Very exciting. Hey, Rachel, how are you? Hey, good. Good to be here. So uh, let's see if you're in the chat. Can you let us know you hear us and tell us hello? Maybe let us know where you're coming from. And again, just a little reminder that we have a hashtag that we're using for the event today. It's WTG for Women Tech Global WTGC 2020. I'll put that in the chat shortly. And we are just going to make sure we're live and we get some confirmation from the crowd. Awesome. We've got some tests. We've got some hellos. So that's a good sign. Um, and all I'm going to do, like we got people from California. Where else are you chiming in from? We'd love to hear. We know that we uh, have a packed schedule today from all hours of the world. Uh, a lot of Chicago, New York, they're hearing us great. And um, so we're just going to go ahead. I'm going to introduce Rachel. So I don't take away from her time. It's such a short time to be here and a lot to share. And Rachel is the vice president at GitHub. Uh, I'm sure she'll tell us a little more of that, Vice President of Engineering, which means that she gets to apply all of her experience from Google. So she's um, got a vast experience of working in this community. So I think she's going to talk to us about the strength of the developer community. So I can't wait to encourage you to listen, soak it up, and meanwhile, find a local developer organization in the community that you could go out with, check out all of this action that's happening. And also she's going to share a little bit about uh, just software engineering and the evolution. If you don't know about GitHub, then definitely look that up too, uh, because you want to get it because it's definitely key towards uh, so many things. So with that, we are so honored to have Rachel here today to share with us. And um, I'll be right here by your side if you need anything. Thanks, everybody. Let's give her a warm welcome and a hello. Thanks so much, Nicole. And can you just confirm that you can see my slides? Yes, I can. They look perfect. You got okay. it. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. I'm just so happy to be here today with such a, you know, inspiring group of presenters in this uh, great and strong community. And so, as Nicole said, I'm here today to talk about develop developer productivity. And I'm really going to focus on it from a software perspective. I'm going to reflect on the past decade in open source and I'm going to share my thoughts about where we're headed. But I really would like to note that this touch, this talk actually doesn't touch on the very important issues of diversity and inclusion in software teams. And so I did want to call out to another talk that I saw earlier today. So if you didn't catch the talk from Annie Jean-Baptiste, who's actually someone who I used to work with back at Google, um, she did an amazing talk on building products for everyone and talked a lot more about inclusion in software. So I really encourage you to check out that awesome and inspiring talk as well, which is also a super, super important part of this conversation. Okay, but now to get launch into my talk. Oh, excuse me, one sec. Technical difficulties there. Okay, obviously this is me. I'm a VP of engineering at GitHub and my talk today really has three parts. So first of all, I'm gonna take a little time to talk about my own personal journey. Then I'll review the progression of open source over the last 10 years. And I'll close by talking about, um, you know, really what I've learned about developer productivity and the advice that I give to teams. So first, I've been you know, really fortunate enough to have spent the last more than 20 years working in the software development industry. So I'm just gonna take a second to walk through um, my experience there. So my first real job in software was many, many years ago uh, during the dot-com boom, and I was developing e-commerce websites, which is quite a different experience, um, was back then than it is today. Uh, next, after that, I worked in the video game industry for many years. And, you know, way back then, we burned our games to disk. Code quality would just totally plummet towards the end of our development cycles. We were very early in this journey of doing test driven development, and we still relied heavily on manual testers. The concept of DevOps, you know, hadn't been established yet. So it's really easy to understand how video game software has advanced so substantially with the productivity gains, both from you know, sharing of source code and open source, as well as um, better DevOps practices. So you know, after too many years there, I'm gonna say, 
I made the decision that I wanted to change out of this like very male dominated industry, which, you know, had its own set of problems. And, um, you know, like, like many people, I decided, um, you know, I started thinking about stepping out of tech. So I actually took, you know, maybe a step halfway out of the technology industry by turning to consulting for a while. And, you know, in that job, I spent a year working in a financial institution that was a client. And, and by the way, I got to work with some amazing women, which is something I had been missing in my career to date. And, you know, it was really inspirational. But on the work front, um, you know, the transaction system that this financial institution was using was built around software from a company that had gone under. And so for years, this company had been running a binary that they had no way of modifying other than by adding layers of code around it. I mean, you know, it's it's pretty horrifying. Uh, my team worked on re-architecting re-architecting their system to help dig out of that nightmare. And, you know, for me, this is a really obvious lesson on code health that was really hammered home. So after more than two years in consulting, I realized that I wanted to stop wearing suits to work. And I also really wanted to get back to a more technology focused environment. So in 2008, I moved to California to join Google, where I spent many years uh, working on DevOps systems and developer productivity. I later also worked in Google Cloud's, um, Google's cloud business, sorry. And now of course, I'm thrilled to be at GitHub. So, you know, in talking about my journey, I do want to um, bring up one of the highlights of my career at Google, which came back in 2016. So I published this paper entitled Why Google Stores Billions of Lines of Code in a Single Repository about my work at Google in building DevOps systems. And this discussed the use that Google had of a single centrally shared code repository, otherwise known as monorepo, with essentially everyone working from a primary branch. And this is really the first time that Google had talked openly about the scale of its internal developer systems and productivity tooling. So, you know, this really took me by surprise, but it turned out that this paper turned out to be very popular. And last year I discovered that it had actually become the most downloaded paper ever from Communications with the ACM, the journal in which it was published. Um, so that explains as a result over the years why I've been so frequently approached by companies asking me to consult with them on their DevOps practices and developer systems, really based on what I learned at Google. So, you know, as part of my journey, I'll tell you, um, you know, these are, this is the sort of advice that I've been giving to enterprises who ask me about DevOps best practices. So, you know, Google has expensive custom systems supporting this highly scaled central monorepo. And this just isn't feasible for most companies, even extremely large enterprises. But there's still a lot of inspiration that can be taken from the things that worked really well that can be applied in a multi-repo environment. So for instance, you know, thinking carefully about dependency management, investing as much as possible in code health, um, focusing on broad code visibility and sharing and trunk based development or that all working from a primary branch and um, investing in workflow automation and standardization, what we now call DevOps as much as possible. So just rounding out uh, my journey, of course, uh, now I'm in my most exciting role to date and, and can be more happy about it. So uh, the second part of this talk is going to be a look back on the last 10 years of GitHub and open source and where we are today. So this is kind of fun. Um, so way back in 2010, this is what the GitHub homepage looks like. It's pretty fancy. Uh, the site had been already available for two years at that point. Early open source projects hosted on GitHub include Ruby, Ruby on Rails, Node.js, and even Bitcoin. And I actually really like the Bitcoin example, so I'm going to talk about it for a second uh, because it supports one of the concepts that I find really cool about open source. So Bitcoin obviously is a technology for financial transactions where security and trust is just fundamental. And sort of intuitively earlier in my career, I used to think that for software systems to be secure, they really needed to be locked down, private, protected, with really limited visibility to prevent bad actors from being able to find and exploit weaknesses. Well, you know, when you research <laughs> developer productivity, you find out that, um, you know, when you restrict code visibility, you actually tend to end up with worse code quality. 
And it's generally accepted that more eyes on a problem tend to lead to a better, more robust solution. And so this actually holds true for security as well. So Bitcoin has gone the route of open source and of getting as many eyes on this problem as possible to create a robust and secure solution. And so, you know, just stop for a minute. I think it's really cool to think about how open source can really validate a technology by opening it up to enormous scrutiny. So uh, moving along through the decade, so 2011 is where we start to see more of um, sort of these, these DevOps systems coming into play with um, continuous integration gaining traction. So in 2011, Travis CI's first PR was submitted. Jenkins was another excellent um, open source project started around the same time. These are examples of projects that really support the automated modern DevOps workflows that are really flourishing today. Moving forward, uh, the container movement takes shape. And you know, I don't have time in this talk to go into all the details, but this is really a run through. Um, so in 2013, the Docker project was started. And in 2014, Docker 1.0 launched on GitHub, bringing the container program to both enterprise data centers and the cloud. Kubernetes is another really big name here and a huge step forward in the container revolution. This project was open sourced by Google in 2015 to simplify container orchestration, supporting really large scale cloud-based applications. And projects like these really kicked off this container movement, simplifying DevOps and freeing teams from their infrastructure so they could focus um, more on what they were trying to build. So I love showing this graph to talk about Kubernetes, which is really an impressive story. So this graph shows the total unique contributors, so that's human beings, to the Kubernetes project over time. And so last year alone, Kubernetes had almost 7,000 contributors from all around the world. And it was one of the top 10 most contributed to open source projects. On the flip side of that, so that's talking about the number of people contributing on the consumer side, Kubernetes is now used by over half the Fortune 500 companies. So this is one sign that open source really has fully landed with enterprise developers. Moving on, uh, in 2015, we saw this trend towards large enterprises open sourcing their developer tools. And this really took hold with Microsoft in 2015, open sourcing .NET and VS Code. And to talk a little bit more about VS Code, today VS Code is used by uh, 8.5 million developers every month. And on top of that, it's a true community endeavor. So it has had the most contributors, so again, people of any project on GitHub for the last three years running. In fact, many of the top projects on GitHub that you see listed here really started when the tech enterprise giants decided to enter the world of open source. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about data science, especially since I manage the data science teams at GitHub. Um, and you know, this has been another really huge and interesting uh, explosion to watch. So Google first made their machine learning library TensorFlow public in 2015. And today data science and machine learning have really exploded as a domain on GitHub and are powering a couple of cool related trends also that I like to call out. So, First of all, last year we saw Python overtake Java to be the second most popular programming language on GitHub after JavaScript. This was driven largely by activity in this space. And secondly, this trend also contributes to broadening the GitHub and open source community to a set of people who aren't all traditional software engineers, but who of course deserve the tools and automated workflows and so on that software developers increasingly enjoy. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more. This is a little case study on TensorFlow, which is, is pretty cool as well. So today, TensorFlow is one of the most popular projects on GitHub with thousands of direct contributors and tens of thousands of indirect contributors via dependencies. So this is really highlighting the interconnected nature of open source. On the flip side, 46,000 dependent repositories now also rely on TensorFlow, building on the project's network of dependencies. TensorFlow is really a go-to tool for data professionals creating machine learning models. And we also see, though, many other data science packages contributing to this trend, such as the really popular Pandas library, which makes it easy to wrangle data in Python. And for the last three years, Jupyter Notebooks have seen triple-digit growth rates on GitHub. 
So at the end of the last year, I had the pleasure of working on um, GitHub's annual State of the Octaverse report, which is um, sort of our annual report on uh, how GitHub is growing in the GitHub community. I also got to talk about it at GitHub Universe. There's a talk on YouTube if you're interested. Um, and this report really showed that software development is more than ever a community endeavor. So GitHub's universe is growing more and more in interconnected as it becomes so much easier to find and build on work from others around the globe. As of May of this year, there are now 50 million developers on GitHub. 10 million developers joined the GitHub community in 2019 alone, and the rate of growth is only continuing to increase in 2020. So we predict we'll reach 100 million developers by 2025. It's pretty exciting. So behind the world's code is a global and growing team of contributors, and 80% of them are coming from outside the US. So it's really a global endeavor. This is a, a visualization that I really love that my, my team put together, and it shows 30 days worth, worth of open source contributions to github.com. So on this globe, each dot represents a separate contribution to open source made by one person somewhere on Earth. So today, people are writing code for a huge variety of purposes in a large variety of industries, and open source is really everywhere. And while a decade ago it was uncommon for large enterprises to feel comfortable using open source, never mind contributing to it, today companies big and small recognize the value that's available via open source and are engaged in this community. So to sum up the second section of this talk, I will say that you know it's very clear that open source is a huge boon to developer productivity. In fact, research shows that 99% of new software projects at enterprise scale now rely on open source dependencies. Um, even in the software industry where companies are in the business of writing their own proprietary software, on average, 60% of company code bases are comprised of open source. So I'll end this section by saying that it's, a, it's very clear that open source is a game changer for productivity. So now on to the last section of this talk, we're now in a position in the software industry and beyond where we can get millions of people working together collaboratively in a way that will change the world. And I just want to go back to how deeply collaborative the open source community is today. These stats are really just staggering. They're from the uh, 2019 Octoverse report. So for instance, we see 3.6 million repos depend on each of the top 50 open source projects and 350,000 people big, made more than 5 million contributions to the top 1,000 projects in 2019. My first exposure to open source was many, many years ago before GitHub even invented. When I was in the video game industry, someone on my team wrote one line of code that was accepted as a patch to the Linux kernel. Tiny. But the amount of pride and excitement that this generated for this individual was like nothing I'd ever seen from them before, um, despite the fact that we were writing you know, tons of lines of code every day. So to me, this spoke to the real human motivation of being part of open source. Over the last several years, I've led teams working on productivity research, which is really a fascinating topic. My very good friend and colleague, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, who recently joined me at GitHub, is a renowned expert in developer productivity, and she wrote a phenomenal book called Accelerate, which I really highly recommend if you're interested in this topic. She's also the lead author of the annual State of DevOps report, and she's really done extensive research to uncover technical practices that, we, that are known to improve software outcomes. I had the great honor and pleasure of being an advisor on the 2019 report. And you know, I was not surprised to discover that the research findings lined up well with the DevOps practices that I had learned at Google. So essentially, the research shows that predictors of high productivity include use of test automation and continuous testing and CICD, uh, trunk-based development, so everyone working on a, a shared branch, a focus on code maintainability is super important, and shifting left on security or working, that means working to catch vulnerabilities early in the software development life cycle. And we haven't talked about this one yet, so I want to talk a little bit more about security. So. 
is now normal for your product to use tons of open source dependencies. And while this is really cool, it also comes with some challenges. Most importantly, if one of your dependencies has a vulnerability, chances are you do as well. So being able to leverage the work of open source effectively means that potentially thousands of strangers have commit access to your production code. So an innocent mistake or a malicious attack could affect you deeply. And while this creates obvious productivity issues, and this talk is focused on productivity, there are also potentially far worse consequences. So it's really fundamental that we think carefully about um, security. And, you know, this is something my team is working on at GitHub. Um, in fact, you know, we're focused on advanced code scanning that integrates with your workflow, our dependency graph and automated dependency updates and much more are part of this. But is, this isn't a problem that we could ever tackle in isolation. We want to give the community the tools it needs to secure software that we all depend on. So we're working alongside researchers, maintainers, companies across industry to do just that. The idea is to work towards a future where a vulnerability fixed anywhere is patched everywhere and once fixed vulnerabilities are eradicated forever and never to be reintroduced. And so Rachel, I'm, we're going to have to bring it home because we're close to the end of time. Oh, Thank yeah, you. I had exactly 20 minutes of content, I think, and we started a little late. So basically, yeah, fine. Conclusion, here is my up to date take on productivity best practices, healthy dependency management. Um, you know, focus on DevOps, trunk-based development, investing in code maintainability, um, and so on, and really taking a community approach to security. I did have a call to action that I wanted to make, um, which is, you know, one thing we know to improve inclusiveness in open source is better documentation. So a big shout out to all my amazing tech writer friends and anyone who's working on documentation. Um, we see, you know, this, this, Almost 50% of people coming to GitHub are new to programming right now, which is pretty exciting. And so I can leave it there. Thanks a lot, Nicole. There's a lot of good chat here. I didn't really see any questions. Um, we can maybe take just one quick one um, on just getting started on open source, just a quick answer there on how to get started. I think that's great wisdom and then we'll move to the next speaker. Absolutely, GitHub has a, you know, a big investment. I did cut the end of my talk a little bit. I'm gonna say there's a big investment in education. And um, so there's a lot of good content. If you look up Learning Lab, um, there's definitely ways to get started with tutorials. YouTube also has a wealth of information on how to and getting started videos um, specifically for GitHub. And um, you know, we do have a, pro a program called Good First Issue on GitHub, which is a way for open source maintainers to tag things that are maybe not on the critical path, that are an opportunity for people to sort of engage and, and get started. So I, I definitely encourage you to start on that journey. Great, thank you so much, Rachel, Rachel, for a quick 20 minute history of yourself, the open source community and great work that's happening. It's a lot. Please follow her, I dropped your LinkedIn. Um, link into the chat for everyone, as well as her YouTube speech. So um, go ahead and do that. And uh, thanks. We're going to have you uh, exit stage while we bring Mei Wang on. Thanks again, Rachel, for I your contribution. You.